Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time and have a collection of hundreds of monster ecology and strategy videos on my channel. If you like what I do, please consider becoming a member of the channel or backing me on Patreon and subscribing to be here as I upload at least twice a week. The planes of lore, the forces of order, the powers that govern the structure of the planes of existence. In today's video, I'll be talking at some length about the inevitables and the inexorables and the aeons. So I'll be crossing the stream and incorporating both D&D across multiple editions and settings and Pathfinder 2nd Edition and Matt Colville's Strongholds and Followers. I'll also talk about the planet Earth and our prime material plane in a strictly hypothetical fantasy sense with a little fun theory you may choose to incorporate in your games as a little bit of a mind bender. After all, the Mulan race of humans on the planet of Toril were originally from planet Earth, according to the official lore. So let's explore that a little bit. There's a lot which I don't include in this video, which I'll be covering in subsequent videos um, in this sort of series on the forces of law and good and stuff. I must stress that a lot of the stuff I'll talk about, unless I am quoting from official sources, is entirely optional elements you can include in your campaigns. So I'll be riffing on my own ideas about things as well as the official stuff. If you're a fan of the Warforged outside of Ebron, you'll love the stuff I include uh, towards the end of this video. One question I've been asked many times is in a multiverse where the forces of chaos and evil are so prevalent and destructive, so widespread and actively seeking to expand their influence, why are the forces of law, order and good so passive and seemingly aloof from the prime material plane? Could they not just bring their full power to bear and deal with these planes of evil and chaos once and for all? Well, they did, sort of. A large faction of the angels did go on a massive crusade. Dragon Magazine issue 341, which I'll be drawing from extensively, published in March 2006, The Ecology of the Inevitables by David Noonan, talks about this event from the perspective of scholarly works in the game world. And I quote, By the standards of the Eon's old multiverse, the rise of the Inevitables is a relatively recent occurrence. Some historical text, most notably Accounting of the Realms Beyond by Ganthros the Elder and Verses of the Blood War by Hanak Lathar, traced their emergence to 10,000 years ago. Significantly, this coincides with the descent of the Drow on the world of Toril, the first Seros War, which saw the aquatic empires of the Sea of Fallen Stars thrown into chaos and ruin. This whole era for the next thousand years is really the story of the fall of the elven and dwarven civilizations, paving the way for the ascent of humanity. Meanwhile, in the outer plains at this time, angelic creatures called Aphanacts resided in the plane of Mechanus. They were both ambitious and obsessed with justice. The Aphanax raised enormous armies and stormed out of Mechanus to wage a crusade across the plains, bringing vast swaths of the multiverse under their rigid code of law. According to Ganthros the Elder, the gods themselves put an end to the Great Crusade, and according to Lathar, it was even more widespread with an unprecedented alliance of convenience among the fiends of the Lower Plains and the Archons, Angels, and Eladrin of the Upper Plains. Whatever the case, the last Aphanact disappeared some 10,000 years ago. The multiverse was in something of a lawless disarray in the wake of this era of conflict, and then, appearing amidst the spinning and gargantuan gears of Mechanus, these huge... Fortress-like Kraish forges were observed, exactly where they came from, who constructed them, neither Ganthros the Elder or Hanak Lathar can identify with any certainty. Most modern scholars assume Primus has something to do with it, but then why would he not just make them part of his Modron race? I quite like to flip over to Pathfinder here and incorporate the concept of the Aeons. The best way to describe them is the body of beings of various types who serve the Monad, and the monad is the universal concept that all law serves all existence, and in a perfect state of law, everything is part of one system, serving one purpose, with all else being perfectly functional parts of it. If I take the example of the dark powers from Ravenloft, Overgod Ao and the cosmic powers beyond that he answers to, or some of the fundamentally ancient and powerful primordials in the multiverse, the boundary between a fundamental physical law of the multiverse and the most powerful entities of the multiverse are extremely blurry. We as roleplayers like to anthropomorphize these things because it makes them more interesting story elements. The monad is law, the aeons are manifestations of aspects of law, and the massive factories deep within Mechanus thrummed with activity and remained a total mystery for a full decade 
before observers saw the emergence of the very first inevitables. For the first century, they all looked the same as they marched out and they were called the Maruts. If I can digress here for a moment and interject a fun little concept, our planet, Earth, is a part of D&D lore. It's not our reality, of course. This is just make-believe D&D Earth. Our planet is basically a dead magic zone in the game, and the laws of physics are very dominant. There is no wild space or phlogiston either, so Earth can't really be reached by spell jamming D&D space travel. However, it can be reached via magical portals. We know from the lore that D&D Earth was plundered of people from two time periods in Earth's ancient Middle East. Some 5,400 years ago on Toril, by the Amaskari Empire after a great plague wiped out quite a lot of their population. The Earth people were brought over for the next four centuries. They were relatively easy pickings because no Earth humans had any command of magic. Eventually, the slave population began to intermarry with the Amaskari, giving rise to the Mulan ethnicity on Toril. Well, the Amaskari Empire was ruled over by artificer lords. It was an age of technology and magic much like the rise of Lantan and its production of shield golems, smoke powder and other technological wonders. The humans of Earth were no good with magic, but they contributed to the wondrous late period of the Amaskari Empire, which saw some amazing construction and feats of engineering. Look around our planet. In the absence of magic, under the influence of law, it seems we are naturally inclined towards industry, technology and increasing automation. It seems very likely that we will develop artificial intelligence and ever more advanced robotics and cybernetics. Now look at Dungeons and Dragons and the ultimate exemplars of law. The machine entities, which are the inevitables. The machine plane of Mechanus. Now imagine a warforged warlock whose patron is actually an inevitable. Or a warforged cleric of the monad who views both organic and inorganic life as nothing more than different aspects of machines. Equally perfect. But best when combined, like their own life form. Imagine playing a human with an extra-dimensional background origin being our own planet. Though offset as we are from the current 5th edition timeline, so Toril 1492DR is actually the year 1750 AD on Earth, which is just prior to the start of the Industrial Revolution. Steam engines, indoor plumbing, well before interchangeable parts of manufacturing styles, bicycles and the various industrial machines, but still not primitive, and knowledge was being condensed and widely distributed thanks to the printing press. So you could easily, feasibly, make a character who blended in well with a fantasy world like Toril. It's not too big of a stretch. Okay, back to the inevitables. Unfortunately, 5th edition only gives one example, and it's very specific to the city of Sigil. And yeah, this should never have been called a Marut. I'll go further to say this version is certainly not going to survive if we get a 6th edition of the game, because it's not founded in the rich lore of the game, so it has no logical underpinning and falls apart if you try to expand on it in a campaign. So yeah, I treat this monster listing as an advanced clockwork of type of golem, not an inevitable. Though inevitables are not gods, the power that is incorporated into their workings is divine, not arcane. Though for creatures of ultimate lore, they can actually break the rule themselves. No, a far superior version of them is to be found in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition bestiary. But I am less interested in the raw stats of these creatures and would rather focus on what they are and how they operate. So here is a list of the known inevitables. Uh, there's a few in Pathfinder that I need to cover in later videos. I will touch on strongholds and followers as well uh, with the inexorables afterwards. Maruts, most common look like red-eyed, unliving giants carved from a single piece of polished pure onyx stone, with no discernible joints or seams, though they move with the stone somehow flexing and bending smoothly. At a minimum of 12 feet tall, they are massive, broad and heavy, enchanted constructs of seemingly divine origin. Maruts wear golden armour with wide plates on the shoulders and armbands. They speak only in response to direct questioning, except when relaying messages given to them and they understand all languages. Maruts enforce cosmic law and are sent out with a specific target programmed into them. When they emerge from the fortress crash of Mechanus, they are basically memory wiped, and it takes them a bit of trial and practice to learn how to interact with other beings of the multiverse. But they are intelligent, and they do learn and develop a unique personality based on their experiences in the performance of their duty. So think of the Terminator robots. They have a learning CPU. So does the Marut and other inevitables. 
All inevitables share these same traits. They are lawful neutral. They don't have a sense of humour. They are immune to any magic or effect that would alter their physical form. They are also immune to any magic or effect which would hamper their movement. They have true sight and they can sense if a creature or phenomenon they can perceive is chaotic. They are very bothered by chaos and also don't like magic. They typically do not have any bonus to save versus any magic other than that which I've already described. They all self-repair. They do not require food, water, air or sleep and they never suffer from exhaustion nor can they be affected by poison or disease. Some can plane shift under their own power, such as the Marut and Quarut, and Varakut. Others must seek out natural portals and means of transport, such as the Zalakut and Kalyarut. They absorb information like a sponge and have perfect recall. Plus, they usually spend a long time away from the Forge Crash on mission after mission, but they eventually do return and will be reprogrammed, losing their personality and memories once again which they have no problem with. It is their purpose which matters, not their individuality. I'll just quote the 1d4chan wiki descriptions of the different inevitables that they have listed there as they do a fine job condensing the lore down. The Marut is tasked with hunting down those who cheat death and delivering them to the end they escaped. As such, the enemies of the Marut are beings like liches, necromancers, cult leaders, extremely long-lived wizards, those who restore the dead back to life over and over, and this can bring them into direct conflict with those who bring adventurers back to life through resurrection and raised dead, or for anyone who is using necromancy to raise the dead as minions. Maruts are patient in their hunts, biding their time until they are ready to strike. Because of the solitary nature of many of their targets, Maruts have little opportunity to practice their social interactions, and as such are the slowest to develop personalities. What 5th edition is calling a Marut is actually the role of the Kilyarut, which are designed to uphold oaths both spoken and written. They appear like humanoid constructs made of black metal. They often have a half-finished look, with many exposed parts jutting out here and there. Their heads often have the back exposed, and two glowing red eyes look forward from the skull. Kilyarut track down oathbreakers and use intimidation, magic, or outright force to browbeat someone into upholding their bargain. They will only kill if it is part of the bargain in question, otherwise they use spells like Suggestion or Guess in order to get the job done. Kalyarut hold all bargains to be equal in their importance, from the repayment of a monetary debt to the promise of an extra-dimensional horror to destroy the gods. Uh, you can see the book Elder Evils for details on this one. They are the most talkative kind of inevitable. You could say they're almost diplomatic. They often speak with people in places where oaths are normally sworn, such as courts of royalty or law, temples and other such places. As such, they return back to the forged crashes regularly. They do not differentiate between those who have no intent on upholding their oaths, those who unwillingly break their oaths, or those who are not able to uphold their oaths for some reason. If possible, they first inform the targets of them being in breach. If they are willing to uphold their oaths or parts of the oath, the Kolyarit will make sure that they do. Those less willing are made to uphold their bargain through force or magic. But if the Kolyarit discovers that both parties do not keep their ends of the bargain, it treats the bargain as void and dismisses it. The Kwarut are tasked with delivering justice to those who meddle and time and relative dimensions in space, causing rippling effects that distort space and all other kinds of magic babble stuff you normally see on Doctor Who or the antics of the gods. It's an important note that the inevitables do not mess with the actions of the gods. The foes of the Quarut are potent indeed, and as such they keep their distance until they're better understanding of their quarry. They often engage their foes by matter of proxies, interrogate associates and minions, and seek weaknesses in their foes through their support networks. While the Quarut are formidable in battle, the easiest way to deal with them is to determine what they want to fix, and the damage you've done. This is often easier said than done, and may require anything up to and including time travel to undo some calamity. Quarut look like warped marionettes with slender brown frames and complex green gold plating. They tend to employ magic in order to gain the upper hand in battle, even spells like Wish and Time Stop in order to seize their targets. They seem to conveniently ignore the fact that the use of these spells is what they've created in the first place to combat. Zalakhut are centaur-shaped beings with porcelain skin, golden clockwork, mechanical wings, and long-bladed chains that extend from their forearms. They're quite spectacular looking. They are tasked with hunting down fugitives of the law. 
to either bring them in for their proper punishment or, if deemed necessary, carry out the death sentence they escaped. For this, they employ the long chains to disarm and incapacitate foes, then either use spells like Mark of Justice or Gesh to ensure compliance. Failing that, they simply kill their quarry. They are the fastest in their rules as well, their legs and wings allowing them superior speed to chase those who would deny justice. Zalakut take a more intense approach to their searches. They question pastors by with impunity and will resort to violence if they think that the being that they're questioning is holding out. More experienced Zalakut observe those they've interrogated to determine if they're being lied to. Because of the frequent and intense interactions with people, they develop personalities the fastest of all the inevitables, and as such, visit their crace forges very regularly. And Hydroot, or Waste Crawlers, are from the 3.5 edition Sandstorm sourcebook. They're charged with the sacred duty of hunting down and killing anyone who tries to irrigate a desert. And they're named the Unhydrant, to make sure there's no confusion about what its purpose is. They're likely to be all sorts of other natables that have similar roles for different natural environments. They look like a cross between a tank and a scorpion. One of the most potent and rare kinds of inevitable, the Varakut, are meant to uphold the divine order. All those who seek to destroy the gods or become one themselves will eventually get into conflict with these potent beings. They're the most lethal of their kind, employing powerful magic and physical prowess in order to destroy their enemies. Those with a legitimate bid for godhood eventually come to blows with the Varakut, but beings who only think they do are pretty, pretty much safe. While a Varakut is powerful, it's likely no match for a god to be in single combat. Instead, they aim at artifacts, followers, and other sources of a power or reverence for the wannabe god, chipping away at them. There are only a few ways to stop a Varakut, by destroying it, or to ensure that you no longer have a bid for godhood, or by actually becoming a god. If one were to become a demigod or more, you become part of the order the Varakut is sworn to protect, and as such are no longer a valid target. Varakut look the most alien of the bunch. Their bodies have sharp geometric shapes with elongated pyramids for arms. Instead of legs, the torso terminates in a single geometric point. The head is a flat disc on top of a raised tube, giving an alien and inorganic appearance. In Pathfinder, they are similar inevitables to those mentioned, plus many more. Arbiters are the least of the inevitable race, appearing as clockwork orbs dominated by a single eye, with two small hands and a pair of metallic feathered wings that keep them aloft. They serve the inevitables as scouts and diplomats, spreading through the cosmos and keeping an eye on the forces of chaos, whilst also striving to convince people to adhere to the principles of order. To this end, they often allow themselves to serve as familiars to powerful mages. Lakshar roots are powerful inevitables charged with preserving the balance of reality by enforcing the stability of the planes themselves. This doesn't mean they punish every conjurer or planeswalker, neither summoning creatures nor visiting other planes, nor even the occasional creation of a pocket plane or hijacking of a chunk of one reality to serve as a base within another. This doesn't concern them. These are petty infringements that ultimately matter little to the multiversal balance. No, the Laksharut's charge is to keep the plane as a whole separate and distinct from other planes. What concerns them is wide-scale planet integration, such as the formation of a permanent link between planes, or a wide-scale interplanet invasion. And I must stress, this is by non-deific beings. A typical Laksharut is a six-armed construct that appears to be made of a mix of metals and stone. Where a human would have legs, it instead possesses a complex orb of spinning rings similar in shape to an orrery. It is this whirling machine that grants the Laksharut the ability to fly. Four of the construct's arms end in functional hands that it normally uses to carry a mix of weapons. The Laksharit's lower two arms hold large flaming metal spheres in their hands. It uses these spheres to generate elemental bolts of energy that it can hurl great distance to damage foes. Castamuts are an inevitable breed who resemble clockwork statues of dwarves, who many have speculated about a deeper meaning behind this. In essence, they are embodiments of conservatism. A Kastamut's charge is protecting the civilization's traditions and customs. They oppose sudden radical changes in the course of a culture's traditions and work to prevent the destruction of its established belief system, rights, and social customs. That said, like Lakshariots, they do have the ability to prioritize. A petulant child resisting his parents' teachings draws no attention from this creature. Even fundamental shifts in the beliefs shared by a large group of peoples is allowed so long as they progress along the lines of a normal cultural development. This is an extremely nuanced body of law. 
What customers do work against are immediate substantial changes, such as when a new ruler outlaws a nation's long-standing religion and seeks to wipe out all practice of the old faith in favour of a new one, especially if the new religion has no precedent. Turning slowly from old ways to new ones can be part of a natural order, but violently rebelling against tradition practices in favour of untested systems gives rise to chaos, both in the prime material plane and in the upper planes, which the powers of the monad cannot abide. Hikariutes and Impariutes are two sides of the same coin. Both are enforced with preserving order by preventing riots, revolutions and other sudden violent changes in government. The difference is how they tackle both. Both appear as imposing strongly built humanoid statues of stone, but the Hikariute specifically focus on putting down the riot and the Impariute focuses on preventing riots by rooting out governmental incompetence and corruption. Despite their appearance and reputation as blunt objects that exist to simply crush revolutions by force, not helped by the huge hammers that they carry, Hikariutes are neither dumb nor as single-minded as Akshariutes. Using a sledgehammer when a scalpel will do only serves the forces of chaos. As such, Hikariutes prefer to talk first and dissuade rebels and rioters, and if forced to violence, prefer to subdue non-lethally rather than massacre their foes. They typically take the attitude of a stern parent scolding a naughty child. But if things are serious enough, they are not afraid to make more dramatic points by pulverizing stubborn demagogues. And Pariutes are similarly flexible, by inevitable standards. They understand that a lack of give and take or an all-stick approach will only worsen the problem. Stern but usually fair, they tend to prefer a subtle approach, a diplomatic approach, a political approach, to the corrupt or incompetent rulers whose efforts called them forth and try to redeem them. If redemption is impossible, they will publicly dethrone them and see their replacement with a better candidate. Novid Naruts are one of the stranger inevitable models. These inevitables are charged with overseeing cultures that have developed a tradition of honour duelling. Whenever mortals will settle matters of dispute through honourable combat, Novid Naruts are subtly dispatched to protect the sanctity of these duels, though understandably they usually focus on conflicts or duels that have higher stakes such as an honourable battle that determines the fate of a kingdom. They take their appearance of silver and green suits of samurai armour overlaying a clockwork endoskeleton with their blank face save for six green gemstone-like eyes. Pleromas are a manifestation of the duality of creation and destruction. Their physical manifestation is a constant state of flux between these two poles. Their forms a shifting cloak of black where galaxies and other celestial objects flit in and out of existence, as if depicting the constant life, death and rebirth of a miniature self-contained universe. Pleromas see the multiverse as both eternal and cyclical, doomed and malleable, ending only if these cycles ever become unbalanced. They believe the current convergence of reality is necessary to obtain this essential balance, that the the current multiverse in this is in a state of uh, pivotal flux, um, the end of a cycle and the birth of a new one, and act to ensure that the grand design of the monad is carried out to the smallest detail. They are formidable opponents with the ability to generate spheres of creation and destruction, a wide array of divine spells, immunity to positive or negative energy, and the ability to mentally communicate with any other aeon or in, inevitable in the same plane as itself. So they're kind of the commanders-in-chief. Valharuts have no greater purpose. They are the oldest form of inevitable, serving as soldiers of the axial fighting forces of Mechanus and fighting an endless battle against the powers of chaos. They appear as four-armed, blank-featured humanoid statues of marble, and you will see them employed en masse if there's ever an outbreak of demons or of chaotic forces, the far realm or anything like that within Mechanus itself, or the planes of order. Inevitables are beings largely retired in Pathfinder 2nd edition, getting folded into the Aeons who move to uh, the lawful neutral, strict lawful neutral. The stated reason for this is that the creators disliked using a concept that was neither their creation nor drawn from mythology, so they're shifting away from traditional D&D, which is fair enough. The team that crafts their monsters has absolutely nothing to worry about there. They're quite brilliant, and I look forward to showcasing more Pathfinder creatures in future videos. Finally, Matt Colville's Strongholds and Followers and Nextrables. These are what the Inevitables should have been for 5th edition, really, 
and while they are fairly simple, they do make a lot more sense. Also, the names are entirely descriptive of what the inexorables in question does. We have space. These enforce the laws of space. <laughs> They'll tell you that the fundamental theorem forbids extra-dimensional transgressions of this prime manifold. Or some such. They're fairly formidable combatants. While they may put a stop to any effects that grant teleportation or additional movement, they themselves can make three slam attacks per round and have a movement speed of 40 feet. Like all the inexorables, they suffer from disadvantage on all saving throws against spells, but they're pretty tough. The death inexorable enforces entropy and the end of things, but it can also prevent an untimely death or end to a thing. At the start of each of death's turns, undead within 10 feet of it take 10 force damage automatically, and it has a special area of effect anti-death pulse, or anti-undeath pulse, that it can unleash, as well as lots of slam attacks, plus it has a spell-like ability to cast Death Ward three times per day, otherwise just a tough construct. Change has wheel feet and is a bit like a cross between a dune buggy and a centaur. It can hurl javelins and prevents magical healing at close range. It fights to prevent magical alteration of the course of events that includes magical repair of wounds. Fate can hover and fly, has a special power called the Light of Destiny and exerts its power to remove chance and randomness. So in game terms, it removes dice rolls and instead assigns averages to everything, which is actually the most interesting feature of all the inexorables, and would probably pair well with the powers and abilities of other types if they ever work together in the same encounters, which they very rarely do. Time looks like an hourglass surrounded by arms holding a metal loop. It can haste itself, take extra turns, unleash a ferocious flurry of slam attacks, prevent bonus actions and reactions, but still is otherwise just a tough melee opponent. I think Nature, the last of these inexorables listed, is the most likely to be encountered by player characters, particularly spellcasters, because Nature essentially works directly in opposition to magic, with spell-like abilities to cast Banishment and Counterspell, plus the ability to take a second try at its melee at slam attacks, hitting opponents just by making a wisdom saving throw. Plus it grants nearby allies advantage on saving throws and, well, I think it's just one of the coolest looking of the bunch. You can see the divine light of lore sizzling within its perfectly constructed cogs, wheels, joints and internal components, plated in complex, highly durable, polished metal alloy armour. just looks spectacular. I would encourage you to use these stack blocks as basic concepts as a base listing that you can then enhance with further features and abilities of the inevitables found in early editions, particularly 2nd edition and 3.5 edition lore, and of course if you want to adapt the various inevitables which I haven't mentioned from Pathfinder. Okay, returning to the Dragon Magazine article, there are some additional details on the day-to-day -day existence of the inevitables, and I quote, Inevitables have no culture of their own. They're too single-minded to fit well in the societies of other creatures. A typical inevitable leads a lonely existence, making friends only when convenient, and having no enemies beyond the current target. It's a creature of such singular purpose that emotions and moods are irrelevant. Although some inevitables do feel a vague, brief sense of satisfaction when they carry out a mission successfully and enforce the cosmic law they were created to uphold. The mind of an inevitable is a mind of a hunter, willing to overcome any hardship, endlessly patient, and are perfectly able to put aside their self-awareness and personality to work in the service of the law. In David Noonan's notes within the article, he talks about the origin of the inevitables within the game's development, and I quote, When Jeff Grubb, Bruce Cordell, and I split up the writing duties for the 2001 Manual of the Plains sourcebook, I was lucky enough to get the monsters chapter. At the time, the only monsters anyone had were the ones in the Monster Manual, because the third edition of D&D was less than a year old. First, I wanted to check for gaps in the existing supply of monsters to make sure that we had at least a starting point for adventures on every plane. Second, I poured through the first and second edition sources, looking for planar monsters that I could promote into the new rules it set. I saw a gap in the available denizens of Mechanus. At the time, the Formian ant-like race were the sole occupants of that plane. They're great monsters, but it strained the imagination to have Formians enforcing laws, chasing down criminals, and meting out punishment from within their hives. The same held true for the second edition Modrons. Eventually, as I was at my desk flipping through the Planescape Monstrous Compendium Appendix, looking for good monsters, I came across the Marut, and it wasn't much of a stretch to imagine these guys as enforcers of the law, 
Because the inevitables are lawful neutral, I wanted them to function as enemies or allies. Thus, their natural laws had to be laws that you could imagine player characters upholding or breaking, depending on the circumstances. So the laws in their associated inevitables were deliberately selected to be the ones most applicable to player characters. Don't try to cheat death. Don't break a contract. Don't escape justice. Don't mess with space and time. Don't mess with the gods, and so on. Well, this video got pretty huge, and I have to leave out of the additional inevitables to be found in Cobalt Press's Creature Codex. Hopefully there's enough interest in this video to expand on it with more information. And I do look forward to your thoughts on incorporating D&D Earth into your campaigns and cosmology in the comments section down below. In a future video, I'd like to talk about the human connection. Any of you who have watched the first episode of Mandalorian, I'm happy to say that there's a, an entire knightly order of mortals who emulate the inevitables as best they can because they see them as exemplars of how to deliver justice to the multiverse. So it's quite possible to be a humanoid knight player character, say an eldritch knight for instance maybe, who is traveling the multiverse and every now and then in the course of your duties, an inevitable will show up as your ally because you just happen to be on the same mission they are. So it's kind of like in Warhammer 40k when all of a sudden the Dreadnought busts out and uh, starts helping the Imperial Guard. Please hit the like button if you've made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos, buy some merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and always, as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.